For me to introduce uh, James Beasley, our ecology seminar speaker for today. I'm gonna to kind of keep it short and sweet because I think he's got a very fascinating seminar ahead for us all. Um, James is an associate professor at the Savannah River Ecology Lab and at the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources at University of Georgia. He received his BS from the State University of New York and an MS and PhD in wildlife ecology from Purdue University. Um, I'm really fascinated to see this, this talk he's gonna give because he's probably the only wildlife ecologist I know that likely has to carry a Geiger counter around doing field work. I mean, at least, <laughs> at least probably is needed uh, for where, where he goes and what he does. So, um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Beasley. So go ahead, James. All right, let me pull up my screen here. All right, is that coming through on your end? Good to go. All right. Well, well, thank you, Eric, for that that introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to to be back with you all here again. Uh, my talk today is going to be a little different than yesterday, and I, I think uh, illustrates some of the breadth of topics that I work on uh, and my students work on in my lab. And what I decided to talk about today is some of the work that I'm involved in over in Chernobyl and Fukushima to investigate, you know what is happening with wildlife populations there. And, and I've, you know, much of the work that we're doing there is focused on large mammals and, and that's what most of my talk's gonna focus on, but we're also incorporating studies on, on herps and, and a variety of other species as well. So when, when most people hear the, the word Chernobyl, the, the first thought that often comes to their mind is something like this, you know, an abandoned wasteland that's largely devoid of life. And any animals that live there, you know, must look something like this, you know, highly mutated, you know, no chance of survival. And, and a lot of that perception is driven by, uh, you know, social media, popular media, there are movies, there are video games that all kind of promote this idea that Chernobyl is this radioactive wasteland that, that no organism could possibly survive. And this has kind of fueled this recent interest in, in dark tourism. And Chernobyl now, in the Ukrainian portion of the exclusion zone, there's this really growing and massive tourist industry where, where people are flocking from all over the world to come see the city of Pripyat, which uh, you know, maybe you've seen the, the HBO series on Chernobyl. There's a whole variety of different books and, and films now on Chernobyl. And, and a lot of that is just kind of feeding this interest in Chernobyl. And so for those of you who, who aren't that familiar with Chernobyl, this is a, a power plant in the former Soviet Union. And due to some human error and, and faulty, uh, faulty uh, you know, facilities, there's a massive explosion in the middle of the night where about 5% of the reactor core exploded out of the reactor and, and was a devastating human and environmental tragedy. And, and to this day and hopefully forever it is the worst nuclear accident that we'll have. And so there were some severe impacts to the surrounding landscape. But what a lot of people don't necessarily uh, realize is that the radiation from Chernobyl was disseminated throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And in fact, the rest of us, the rest of the world outside of the Soviet Union learned of the Chernobyl accident when some uh, you know, power plant workers up in Scandinavia had their dosimeters you know, reading really high levels of radiation. And that's when they started to put you know, two and two together that there must have been some massive nuclear accident. But even today, reindeer up in Scandinavia, wild boar in parts of Eastern Europe, they all register pretty high levels of, of radiocesium in particular in their tissues, still 30 something years after the accident. And so given the extent of the accident, once it was known how devastating it was in the days and, and weeks after the Chernobyl accident, the Soviet government created the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, which is what it's known as today. And so basically they drew a 30 kilometer radius around the reactor and evacuated 
all the people. And so this wasn't one of those situations where, you know, everyone had a week to, to gather the things and leave. They were packed into buses and, and, and hastily left the area. And so uh, a lot of their belongings infrastructure were left behind. Um, and so the people were removed from the landscape and, and the roads were gated off and guarded, but wildlife were allowed to persist and, and come and go on and off the exclusion zone as they wished. And so this is what uh, the landscape looks like today. And so we often, if you, if you look online and, and look up pictures of Chernobyl, you often see pictures of, of Pripyat, which is that city that has the, the, the trees overgrowing the, the abandoned buildings and things like that. But in reality, uh, much of that landscape was agriculture, rural agricultural farm towns, something like this. And so uh, nature's, nature's begun to recover. Uh, you know, the trees are, are growing up in and around houses, like you can see here. And so it just has this feel of, of decaying human presence on the landscape. And so, you know, as I became interested in, in Chernobyl, I started to, to dig into uh, kind of what we know about that accident on populations. Because, you know, prior to several years ago, if you look in the literature, there was very little work on large mammals. And so this is, is one of those things that piqued my curiosity. And, and one of the things that's very clear that we do know is in the hours and days after the accident, there were some severe initial effects to biota. And so you can see here, in this image in the, in the foreground, that's what's known as the red forest. This is about maybe 1% of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And you can see the power plant in the background there. And so this is a, a pine forest that the entire forest was killed due to the radiation exposure. And so those trees were subsequently cut down and buried. But uh, the broader point is that, you know, there were some severe initial effects to a variety of different organisms. But after those you know, initial days, that's where things get a lot more complicated. Uh, if you think back to your, your chemistry class, uh, you know, a lot of these radionuclides undergo radioactive decay. And, and many of these were very short lived and with some, you know, there are others that are very long lived. But in general, the radiation dose rates now are about a hundred times lower than they were at the time of the accident, the Chernobyl accident. And you know, this isn't to imply this isn't a contaminated landscape. This is still one of the most contaminated places on earth. But in terms of dose and effects, most of the exclusion zone, the vast majority of it right now has dose rates that are below the threshold at which laboratory studies might suggest we would see effects. That said, these animals are still accumulating massive amounts of radiation in their bodies. Um, and, and so that's really, you know, propose the question of you know, what are the, the broader health impacts and population level impacts to these animals that are exposed generation after generation to this chronic radiation exposure. And so, you know, if you dig into the literature a little bit on this topic, uh, you know, prior to, to several years ago, there's a lot of disputed evidence. There are studies that find substantial effects. There are studies that find no effects whatsoever. And, and so this is, is one of the things that really piqued my curiosity into this research. And, and kind of serving as a little more of a catalyst for me personally, they actually introduced some large mammals into the Chernobyl exclusion zone in the 90s, you know, about a decade, maybe 12 years after that accident. They introduced a population of European bison and Przewalski's horses. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the horses, especially a couple slides from now. And so that really set up these, these differing paradigms of, of what's going on at Chernobyl. And, you know, we have, you know, if you look in the, the peer reviewed literature, there are folks that are saying that Chernobyl is the, the largest ecological sink out there. And then yet we have these other threatened and endangered species that are being introduced to the exclusion zone. And so, you know, as I was developing my research program, this is something that just really, really I found troubling and intriguing. And so I really became interested in, in trying to, to dig into this and especially from a large mammal perspective, because as I mentioned prior to this, most work had been done on invertebrates or in birds or in small mammals, you know, species that we can, uh, we can conduct studies on in a little bit more reasonable timelines with a little bit less resources. 
And so I really, uh, you know, developed collaborations with a whole variety of different researchers from across many different countries in Europe, uh, in Japan, uh, over in Belarus and Ukraine. And, and really our goals were to, to try and determine what the population level responses for these large mammals were after the Chernobyl and, and subsequently Fukushima accidents. Also to, to explore how radiation influences where these animals are on the landscape. And so are these animals just simply persisting on the fringes of these abandoned landscapes and, and, and treating them as a sink population, if you will, or are they actually surviving, reproducing and thriving in some of the more contaminated areas? And kind of linked to that, uh, you know, we're really interested in understanding the movement behavior, how animals are interacting with these abandoned landscapes, but also trying to dig into this question a little bit more from a radiological perspective and understand what the radiation doses these animals were experiencing and how that might be linked to some health effects. And so ultimately, that's the end goal here with all of this research. And that's kind of where we're getting to this point. At the very end of the talk, I'll touch a little bit on some of the health effects studies we're doing. These are uh, kind of in the, the later stages of, of development uh, and execution. But, but you know, from a broad scale, we're trying to look at population level health effects, individual level effects like reproduction, and then molecular level effects. And so the Chernobyl exclusion zone, as I mentioned, was in the former USSR. So this is now the countries of Belarus and Ukraine. And the exclusion zones almost split 50-50 between Belarus and Ukraine. And, and prior to the work that I'm going to talk about today, almost all the work that's published in, in the English literature, peer-reviewed literature, was done in Ukraine. Uh, and I won't get into all the reasons why that's probably the case, but we wanted to focus a lot of our work in the Belarusian portion of the exclusion zone. And so a lot of times throughout this talk, you're going to see a figure like this, you know, pop up. And, and I guess what I want to emphasize here is that the radiation distribution in this landscape is incredibly heterogeneous. You can have an area the size of, of an office that might have highly variable levels of radiation. But if you scale out a little bit, within the scale of, of maybe a football field, you might have an order of magnitude different in radiation exposure, which really adds a layer of complexity to a lot of these health studies. And so as a young faculty member, I thought, you know, I'd just hop on a plane and go over there and, and do some work in these areas. And it turns out it's not so easy to go do work over in Chernobyl. In fact, it's, it's almost impossible. And so we spent the first several years of this work trying to develop collaborations and, and, uh, and work through all the, the paperwork that goes into doing work in, in some of these areas. But eventually persistence pays off. And, and one of the first things that we tried to do was, was try to understand what happened after the accident. And you know, we can't, uh, haven't quite developed that time machine yet, but we were very fortunate that the Belarusians at that time had collected some really incredible data. So right after the accident, they had gone up in helicopters for the first decade after the accident during the winter and done standard large mammal population counts. And you can see here on this figure, they, they had three study areas that cover a, a broad range of, of radiation exposure. And so when we began to, to explore these data, you know, some really interesting patterns emerged. You know, unlike what we might have expected, uh, to see stagnant or even reduced populations, populations of these large mammals actually increased substantially in that first decade after the accident. And, and reproduction of, you know, of these species, wild boar have, have much higher fecundity than the other species. And you can see wild boar populations especially took off until, they, uh, until a disease came in in 1994 uh, unrelated to, to radiation issues. But this was really a, you know, a surprising and intriguing finding that these animals recovered so quickly and expanded their populations. So again, this is a rural area. There was, these animals were hunted. Uh, there was a lot of human presence on the landscape. And so kind of the next logical question was, you know, were these animals just expanding in from the, the less contaminated areas or perhaps moving in from outside of the exclusion zone? And so with this, we turn to track count data. So again, a, another fairly standard technique used in, in this part of the world. And here we're talking about several hundred kilometers of transects that were, work, that were walked for several years across a, a gradient of radiation exposure and also a gradient of habitat types. 
And so uh, I think we had 17 different species that we included in these analyses. And, and again, uh, a little bit to our surprise, we see no relationship between the relative abundance of these animals and radiation dose. And so I just picked four here just to highlight uh, as some examples. But in fact, it turns out we find these animals where the, an where the habitat is suitable. And so there's no relationship with radiation whatsoever. And so we've been able to, to show that populations you know, increase quickly after the accident and they seem to be somewhat widespread. And so, you know, the next question we were, we were trying to tackle was, you know, how do these populations compare to some of the other nature reserves in the area? Because there's no, you know, for the most part, there's very little or no harvest pressure inside Chernobyl. And so this is a really busy graph. So if you want, just focus your attention on the, the dark gray bar on the right of each species. And elk is, is actually moose. Elk, uh, moose in, in Europe are referred to as elk. Uh, and so, you know, really the, the broader point of this figure is that, you know, across all these other nature reserves in Belarus, the wildlife are, are as abundant or more abundant in Chernobyl than these other nature reserves. And, and one of the things that really stood out to me was with wolves. You know, wolves were, were several times more abundant in Chernobyl than some of these areas. And, and just when you drive around the landscape, I mean, just the presence of scat, the presence of tracks. I mean, it's just, you know, overwhelmingly uh, 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 obvious that there's an abundance of wolves in this landscape. And so, you know, once we finally were able to get permission to do a lot of our own studies, one of the first things that we tried to do was set up a, a whole series of different remote camera studies. And so we set up sense station surveys targeting carnivores. Uh, one of those studies is, is here on the left where we, we distributed cameras throughout the entire exclusion zone, again, covering different habitats, different radiation doses. Uh, we've tried, you know, we've done baited studies, we've done unbaited studies, a whole variety of different camera experiments. And we also did some scavenging studies to try and, and quantify the, the efficiency and diversity of the scavenging community in Chernobyl. And so again, this is really similar questions to some of those others that we asked with the track count data, but trying to corroborate that with some other tools and techniques and, and a little bit more modern technology. And this is just a quick video, hopefully it'll play, just showing a, a couple of the species that, you know, I, this is a really short video just for the sake of time, but this is a, a roe deer here. Maybe we'll play. I'm not sure why that's not playing, but anyways, uh, you know, we captured a whole diversity of wildlife across these surveys. And when we, and, you know, again, run some of these occupancy models, these relative abundance models, we don't see any relationship between radiation exposure and where we find these animals on the landscape. It's purely, their distributions are purely driven by habitat associations. Animals that are more associated with open habitats, we tend to find them in open habitats. And so, you know, based on all these lines of evidence, the, the, the distribution of radiation on the landscape doesn't really seem to be driving any sort of occupation or occupancy or, or distribution patterns. Similarly, with some of our scavenging work that we're, we're doing, we're seeing a really incredible diversity uh, of scavengers. So here we're able to target not just carnivores, but a number of different birds. We've documented some, some rare eagles and, and things like that, uh, some semi-aquatic species. And, and so some really incredible scavenging diversity here. And one of the, the real highlights from some of the scavenging work has been uh, not only the diversity of species there, but also the efficiency of this community. And so during the winter trials, almost 100% of our trials were scavenged within one week. And so if you dig into the, you know, the dozens and do dozens of scavenging papers that are out there, this is, you know, really in the upper end of the distribution in terms of, of efficiency of scavenging communities. And so, uh, you, know, you know, basically to suggest that, that this is an efficient community and a diverse community that's existing in here. So here we'll be able to, to build in multiple lines of evidence that, that's not being driven by just a couple of species in this area. And one of the things that I've been, been really fascinated with, this is more of, of just a, an observational science um, but the first time I went to Chernobyl, one of the, the people, one of the scientists that was escorting us, 
took us into one of the houses there. And, and inside that house, there was a farrowing nest of a wild boar where she, she had, had given birth to her piglets, which I just found fascinating. And the more that we were poking around different buildings and things, there's just the presence of wildlife absolutely everywhere. We've seen owls in houses. Uh, we've, we've seen measles carnivores in a lot of these houses. But then there's also these barns. You know, remember, this is an agricultural area. And we see a lot of presence of a variety of wildlife species inside these barns. And so, you know, just recently we started some camera surveys to try and see if these barns could be useful locations to do, do surveys for more elusive species like these endangered Brzewalski's horses. And unfortunately this may not play either. So, uh, so sorry about that. Um, not sure why it's not playing on the live stream here, but you know, Basically, when we put cameras in these barns, we see some absolutely amazing footage of these animals. So these Przewalski's horses are going in, they're sleeping in these barns. We have uh, photos of lynx going in, and it seems like they're probably hunting rodents inside these barns. Uh, we've got um, wolves, wild boar, even big, huge bull moose walking through these abandoned barns. And so, you know, it's really unclear at this point how these animals are, are using these barns, whether they're influencing uh, survivorship or food availability in, in any way. But, you know, this is an area that receives some pretty harsh winters. And, and so it's, you know, it's possible that these could be acting as a source of, of thermal refugia. And so that's something that we're currently exploring to try and dig into a little bit more. And so I mentioned early on that, that uh, there were some species introduced into Chernobyl. And this is the species that's really captivated my interest in particular. This is the Brzewalski's horse. Uh, it's one of the most endangered large mammals on earth. It was extirpated from the wild in the 1970s. And since that time, there's been six introduced populations, mainly in, in the China, Mongolia area. But there's one population that for reasons that I'm still, are still elusive to me, there was a population introduced into Chernobyl in the late 1990s. So about 12 years, uh, 13 year, 12 to 13 years after that accident. And these animals were, were introduced and kind of left to their own. There's not a lot of intensive active management. There's hardly anything known on their demography, genetic diversity, population dynamics, or their behavior, which is one of the reasons we've been trying to do some exploratory pilot studies, looking at some of these barns as potential sampling locations for this species. And so this is a species that, that we're really excited to try and expand and do some work. There's a lot of additional red tape to working with such an endangered species in a landscape that's that's so inaccessible. But nonetheless, I think this is a, you know, a really important area of study. If we have these animals on the landscape, it would really behoove us to, to learn a little bit more about, you know, whether or not they're impacted in any way by radiation exposure. But really, it's the gray wolf that, that's really captivated most of my interest ever since we've been working over there. As I mentioned, from the first time that we started driving around the exclusion zone, uh, you see the presence of wolves absolutely right everywhere on the landscape. And when we go through and, and look at some preliminary scat data that we collected to try and, and individually ID in individuals uh, from their scat, we see hotspots of activity in abundance inside the core area of the exclusion zone. Remember, this is only the top half of the exclusion zone. The bottom half in Ukraine is kind of the reciprocal of the Belarus side uh, and about the same size. So this is the, the most contaminated area and these data are suggesting that these animals are concentrating their movements and activity in some of these more contaminated interior parts. And so one of the things that we set out to do is really try to understand how these animals were interfacing with the, the surrounding landscape of, of the exclusion zone and how they're interfacing with the contaminated areas. And we did this for a couple of reasons. One, from a pure spatial ecology perspective, a lot of my interests are in spatial ecology of animals. But in addition to that, one of the main motivations for getting into this research is that there's really... Uh, you know, it's really difficult to develop risk assessments and understand health effects when you can't accurately quantify radiation exposure in animals. And so a lot of assumptions are made about how animals use the landscape. So for example, researchers might catch uh, 
catch a, a, a rodent and, and make some assumptions about how that animal's using the landscape and what its radiation exposure might be by taking a, a measurement at that capture location. Well, that might work for, for a shrew or, or, a, or some other small mammals, but for an animal like a wolf that moves around, you know, tens of square kilometers or hundred square kilometers, you know, those kind of, those, those are pretty loose assumptions from my perspective. And so we actually teamed up with uh, some radio ecologists and some telemetry manufacturers, and we actually developed a new type of, of radio transmitter that couples GPS transmitter capabilities with dosimeter capabilities. So on board, these transmitters have electronic dosimeters that interact with the GPS. And so every time it collects a GPS location, it calls up the dosimeter and asks, you know, what's my recent radiation dose? And it transmits all that through the cellular network or, or a satellite network. And so we're able to, in real time, map the distribution of radiation exposures, as well as the spatial and temporal variability in radi radiation exposures for those animals. And while we have the animals anesthetized, we also take radiation measurements on them as well. And so in Chernobyl, we've uh, been working with raccoon dogs and wolves mainly at this point. And so we track these animals for a couple of years. So we've, we've got uh, two different deployments at this point of, of collars on, on Chernobyl wolves. And I'm not going to have time to, to go into all the details, but just wanted to pull out a couple highlights to share with you. And so all of our work, as I mentioned, has been in the Chernobyl portion of the exclusion zone. But you can see both the Chernobyl and Ukrainian portion here on the map. And, and what you can see is that you know, not a single one of our wolves that's a, a resident uh, you know, territory, maintains a territory, is leaving the exclusion zone. And it's not to suggest that there aren't some individuals that come and go from the exclusion zone. I'm sure there are some peripheral packs that, that do that. But across all the packs that we've been able to call her to this point, uh, which is several, none of them are, are, are making these extensive forays out into the surrounding landscape. And I think there are, are two reasons, at least two logical reasons for that. When you look at the boundary of the exclusion zone, especially to the north and the south, it's highly fragmented. So think of, of central Iowa, uh, huge grain fields, you know, several hundred acres or more in size without much uh, you know, vegetation cover beyond uh, the crops themselves. And on top of that, there's a bounty on wolves in these areas and really heavy hunting pressure on wolves. So, you know, if you're a wolf, there's a, a real negative incentive to, to leaving the, protect, the, the protection of the zone. And so, you know, this is just some preliminary studies. We haven't, we haven't published these data just yet, but, you know, for a handful of individuals where we started to look at resource selection patterns and things of that nature, one of the most important variables in our analyses appears to be the distance to the border. And so, as I mentioned early on from those SCAT studies, these animals seem to be uh, avoiding these borders or at least concentrating their movements towards the interior portion of the exclusion zone. And as you can see here on this map, you know, remember that's the most contaminated portion. So these wolves are, are actually getting increased exposure to radiation by concentrating their movements in those areas. And we also see other you know, common parameters like the percentage of forest cover influencing their movements as well. And we have been trying to focus our, our collaring on more mature individuals, uh, adults, but we have collared a couple of younger individuals and one of our young males actually dispersed from the exclusion zone, like you can see here, uh, actually dispersed from Belarus into Ukraine and over into Russia, where it ultimately ended up. And, and so this is, brought up a couple of really interesting points. So we, we know that there's a lot of reproduction of wolves going on inside the exclusion zone. And the real question is, uh, are these animals leaving the exclusion zone? And for a couple of reasons, you know, from a more ecological perspective, you know, if this is a place that's sustaining a high density of wolves, you know, could this possibly be serving as a potential source population even for the surrounding landscape? And from, a, from an effects perspective, you know, if so, if these animals are leaving on occasion, what are the implications of that? Do these animals have any, uh, any mutations or any, any other health impacts where we should be concerned about that? But where things get a little bit more interesting is in terms of radiation exposure. You know, remember I, I said that a lot of times when risk assessors are coming in to try and assess 
risks of radiation exposure to, to wildlife, to humans. They're trying to be as conservative as possible. And so what they typically do is make some assumptions about how those animals are using the landscape. And in this case, oftentimes what they'll do is take averages over the landscape. And so what we did was take our wolf data and those dosimetry measurements from on the actual animals themselves and run them through these standard risk assessment protocols. And what we found is that in most cases, the models actually under predict exposure. So by collecting these additional data, we're able to identify that these models really aren't conservative enough and that we're, we're really under predicting what these animals are exposed to. In terms of temporal and spatial variability, you know, we would expect, you know, just looking at that map, you would imagine that a wolf that is, has a territory on the northern or, or western boundary is going to have different radiation exposure than on the, the southern boundary. And that's exactly what we see. You see the, the wolf on the top there is experiencing about 11 microsieverts per day with the one at the bottom who's actually hanging out really close to the reactor itself uh, is almost an order of magnitude higher. So, so that's pretty intuitive and, and we would have, have assumed that going into this. But where things get a little more interesting is when we look at that temporal scale. And so here's a two week period for one wolf. And uh, I, I picked this because it showcases, you know, this is a broader pattern we see across the board. But I think this highlights uh, one of the points I'm trying to make here. And, and, and this is that, you know, this animal is going from an area of, uh, of zero to one microsieverts per hour up to you know, 30 plus microsieverts per hour within a one week period. And so oftentimes, as I mentioned, when we capture an animal, we take radiation measurements on that spot and make some assumptions that that's you know, representative of the environment that that animal lives in. Well, here we can see that you know, if you had caught that animal in an area with one microsievert per hour, you would have no idea that that animal was spending some time in the more contaminated area or vice versa. So, you know, I think, again, this highlights the fact that, you know, these health effects studies, we need to be really careful in, in some of these assumptions and, and some of the interpretations of the results of them, because there's a lot of noise. And, you know, the more an animal moves on the landscape, the more noise that's going to be brought into these types of analyses. So fast forward from 86 to 2011, most of you are probably at least a little more familiar with the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident. Uh, this resulted uh, from a, a massive earthquake and tsunami, uh, you know, again, a real terrible environmental and, and human tragedy. You know, the tsunami alone killed many, many, uh, uh, many thousands of people. So a very unfortunate, tragic event. It also resulted in a nuclear meltdown and a massive release of radiation, just like in Chernobyl. And just like in Chernobyl, there was an exclusion zone that was created around the reactor. And that's, uh, that's what that area highlighted in green is. So this, you know, again, a large exclusion zone where, where humans were evacuated and, and told that, that they wouldn't be returning for any, uh, any short period of time. The difference in Fukushima though, is that there's been a really aggressive action taken to remediate the landscape. So not only do we have radioactive decay that's reducing contamination levels, but as you can see in the bottom there, you know, they're actively removing the topsoil from the landscape, putting it in bags, removing vegetation, going in, cleaning off the, the siding and roofs of houses, removing the lawns, removing the trees from the yard. I mean, really aggressive action to try and and you know, reclaim the land and remediate the land. And, and just in the first four or five years after the accident, they began opening up parts of the exclusion zone. And today, the exclusion zone is just that area of red in the middle. And so they've remediated you know, uh, probably half to two thirds of the exclusion zone. And the area that remains uh, evacuated is a, a little under 400 square kilometers. But what this has done is created a really unique gradient of, of human, human presence and radiation exposure because people didn't flock back to these areas. Really, uh, only about 10 to 20 percent of the people have returned. So they really have a low density of humans at this time. And so what we did is try to replicate some of the work that we did in Chernobyl to really try to tease out some of these patterns a little bit better in a system where we can ask some questions in a, in a little more robust way. 
And so Fukushima landscape is a little different. It's a, a coastal area that rises quickly into these, these mountains. And so as you can imagine, the, the communities of wildlife differ slightly between mountainous and coastal areas. And so what we did was we created a, a network of 120 remote camera sites that spanned the, the mountainous and coastal areas and also the three zones of human habitation where we had exclusion zone, what I'm calling the restricted zone where humans uh, have partially repopulated and then the, the control zone where, where people were never evacuated and radiation levels were never really all that high. And, and one of the things that I wanna draw your attention to here is, is unlike Chernobyl, these are in a relatively close proximity, these zones to one another. You know, for within, a, within a 20 kilometer radius, you can be from one zone to the, to, uh, from the, the, the exclusion zone all the way into the, the control zone. And so we can ask some questions with, uh, without you know, having some of those confounding effects of differing habitats. So again, just like Chernobyl, we got a, a really wide diversity of wildlife. We have Japanese macaques here. Uh, that species below the macaque is a, a Japanese siro. It's kind of like a, a mountain goat, uh, a little different species uh, than we have here. It lives in a little different habitat than the mountain goat, but, it, but for all intents and purposes, that's it's the most similar species we have here. But by far and away, wild boar were the most abundant species that we saw. And so this is a really busy graph. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull this in a second, but across the board, across all the species that we were able to, to explore, again, we don't see any significant negative effects of radiation. And so this graph and the next one's broken down by the exclusion zone in red, the restriction zone in green, and the inhabited zone in white. And in fact, and here, habitats playing an important role in the, in the relative abundance and occupancy patterns, but really zone and the zone by elevation interaction are what drive, what's driving where these species are occurring on the landscape. And the zone refers to exclude those three, three different color ba bars up above. And so here it's suggesting that these animals are really responding to the presence of humans on the landscape potentially. And three of the species that we see the most pronounced response are wild boar, raccoons, and the Japanese macaque. And these are all three species that are routinely in conflict with humans. Um, boar and macaque in particular are routine raiders of crops. And, and so they're always you know, under some sort of management to try and reduce populations and control crop damage. Raccoons uh, are an invasive species in Japan. Uh, this is the same raccoon that we have here in North America and, and they're, they cause the same problems there as they do here. The only species of all the species that we monitor where we saw the opposite pattern, where we saw a, a higher abundance uh, in the inhabited zone than either of the others was the Japanese Ciro. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. But I wanted to highlight a couple of these, these species in particular. So, so in particular, wild boar, as I mentioned, far more abundant in the exclusion zone than these other zones. So three to four times more abundant in the exclusion zone than the inhabited zone. And we have them, you know, as you can see across the, the coastal and mountainous areas. And, and this is you know, significant in a lot of ways, but it's kind of remarkable from the perspective that, you know, because they've been increasing in abundance so much, the Japanese government has created a massive culling campaign, not too dissimilar to what we have in the US here that I talked about yesterday, to try and remove the species, uh, at least reduce densities in the exclusion and restricted zones. And so as these people are trying to move back to their homes, you know, they have wild boar you know, all over the place that are, are damaging crops and, and making life a little bit difficult. And, and because they're expanding in range so much and in abundance, you know, they're, they're removing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these animals from these areas. So despite all that control, we're seeing this still massive increase in abundance in these areas, or at least relatively higher abundance. Same thing with the Japanese macaque. And, and so again, you know- uh, On the table in there, and you're gonna sign, I think the top page, there's six pages. Just, yeah, I think you just signed that, that top one, I think. Amy, you're on speaker. Um, so Japanese macaques, this is another species 
that is heavily involved in human wildlife conflicts in Japan. They, you know, they're very clever. They, they get into property, they damage crops. And so this is a species that's heavily controlled in a lot of areas. And in fact, when you drive around the exclusion zone, it's not uncommon to see them in buildings on top of roofs and things of that nature. And, and if anyone has any interest in this, uh, I just pulled up a, a little you know, story here that was on NPR last year. It's about a, a gentleman who, who's moved back to his former home in the restricted zone. And uh, this is a, a story on NPR. And, uh, and, and he kind of plays a role of trying to disperse the monkeys from the, with, with firecrackers and things like that, because the monkeys come you know, every few nights and, and kind of damage their property. And so he kind of guards all the neighbor's properties from these monkeys. And so I, I think it kind of highlights some of these things I'm talking about, about the challenges of, of living in these areas that, that have these animals moving in and, and trying to cohabitate with them. And so, like I said, it's, this is not an uncommon scene. This is a picture that, that uh, we took in the exclusion zone. Uh, this troop of monkeys is, is commonly, we commonly see this, this troop in and on, on this house and all the neighbor's houses. So these animals are, are you know, as you can imagine, highly adaptive and, and are really like Chernobyl, taking advantage of these, these new habitats that are opened up. And, and as I mentioned, this has created a really unique challenge in terms of human wildlife conflicts of trying to balance the recovery of, of wildlife populations in these areas with the needs of humans. On the left here, this is a, an elementary school uh, and where you have a, a pig that's being trapped you know, in the playground of an elementary school. And this is a common scene you know, when, when you go around with the, the contract trappers that are there. These are the types of places that, that they're often setting their traps. These animals have, have really moved into these urban environments and, and are really spending a lot of their time there, which, which I'll show you in a second. Now, the only species that's been an exception to these patterns is the Japanese Ciro, as I mentioned. And this has been a, you know, a, a real head scratcher for us. You know, across you know, the other 15 or 17 species that we've been evaluating, not, not a single one has shown uh, a negative response to radiation and neither does the Ciro, but we see a much higher abundance in the inhabited zone in, in general. And so uh, we've been trying to explore this a little bit to understand whether, whether it could be a radiation effect or whether something else might be going on there. And one of the things that, that is out there in the literature a fair bit is Ciro are kind of an elusive species and they're pretty sensitive to competition with ungulates. And there's not a lot of Japanese deer in this part of, of Japan. They live a little bit more further inland. In fact, there's hardly any uh, uh, Sika deer here. And so one of the plausible explanations that, that we're trying to explore a little bit further right now is that perhaps wild boar, you know, another similar species as, as Sika deer, could be excluding them somehow. You know, again, wild boar populations are much, much higher in these areas. And so it remains to be seen whether or not this could be a, a radiation effect issue or potentially a, a competitive interaction with wild boar. And so again, just like Chernobyl, you know, again, a lot of my interests are in movement ecology. So we've really started to do work on a whole variety of different studies over in Japan to, to study the movement ecology and radiation exposure. And so again, we're putting out these GPS dosimeter collars on boar. Uh, we've been working with civets. Uh, just this past year, I had a student who we did a bunch of work on snakes. We actually attached a different type of dosimeter to snakes and GPS transmitters to these snakes to understand how they're utilizing the habitats and, and what their radiation exposures are. And just like Chernobyl, we're seeing some really fascinating observations. You know, at the top left, this is a, a boar who basically moves from house to house to house uh, when you look at its broader home range and then moves out into the abandoned rice paddies to forage. And so these animals are, are really exploiting these, these vacant niches that are uh, these vacant habitats that are available on the landscape. And so that's, you know, in all likelihood, one of the, the real logical reasons why they're expanding in number so much. There's all this new habitat that was no longer available, that, that was previously uh, not available to them. And we do some you know, various types of resource selection modeling. We do see that a lot of these species are actively utilizing these former abandoned areas, these former abandoned urban areas. You know, a lot of our, our meso predators that we've been tracking, uh, the raccoons and civets, you know, we, we routinely see them 
denning up inside of, of buildings, uh, snakes as well. More than half of our snakes uh, in short in these short term studies that we did on snakes were, were seen inside abandoned buildings, uh, probably hunting rodents and things of that nature. So these animals are, are really, you know, just like Chernobyl, exploiting some of these these unique habitats on the landscape. And one of the things that's been really interesting, and, and this is based on camera data, and so we're really, I have a graduate student now who's really digging into this with, uh, with actual collar data from GPS collars. But when you drive around the exclusion zone in Fukushima, this is not a, an uncommon sight. You, know, you routinely see wild boar out in the middle of the day walking around amongst houses and things like that. And, and when you look at the activity behavior, uh, the activity patterns from the remote camera data anyways, we're seeing that boar inside the exclusion zone tend to be more active during the day than boar in the inhabited zone. You know, not, not substantially, but this is a, you know, a, uh, you know, at least statistically significant difference where they seem to be moving around quite a bit more during the day. And in fact, when you're driving around, you know, this simply, you know, this, this clearly seems to be the case. So I'd be curious to see how, how the GPS data play out here as well. And so, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, where we're ultimately trying to go with all of this is to understand and quantify health effects. You know, at the population level, you know, there's not a lot going on, it seems, in terms of, of effects anyways. But what's going on at the, at the individual and molecular level? And so for all these species, you know, we're taking radiation measurements, both through the dosimeters and through analyses of tissue that we collect. And, you know, again, just like Chernobyl, high levels of contamination in these species. And so we've been teaming up with, with folks that have a lot broader expertise in some of these effects. And so one of, the, one of the, the organs that's really sensitive to radiation exposure is the eye. And so one of the studies that we just published uh, with a group out of Colorado State was to look at cataracts in boar because cataracts are known to be uh, a symptom of, of radiation exposure. And surprisingly, we don't see any increased prevalence of cataracts in boar in even the most contaminated parts of the Fukushima exclusion zone. And so I have a PhD student right now who's, who's trying to expand on this a little bit more, and, and we're trying to look at reproductive effects. So we've been collecting ovaries and testes of boar that are collected from control areas and inside some of the most contaminated portions of the exclusion zone. And really, the data there are, are preliminary. I don't have any any nice graphs to show you, but you know, so far, you know, nothing stand out in terms of effects, in terms of reproductive effects. And, and reproduction, again, is one of those things that we often associate with radiation exposure. And then finally, at the molecular scale, we've been teaming up with, with some other folks at Colorado State to look at things like dicentrics, um, so dicentric chromosomes. Dicentrics are, are another sort of molecular level endpoint that's highly sensitive to radiation exposure. And as you can see there, you know, from the figure, uh, there's just no effect that we're seeing at the dose rates that these animals are experiencing in Fukushima. Same thing with telomere length, which, uh, which we would expect to see some sort of effect. And so these animals clearly just aren't reaching any sort of threshold of chronic radiation exposure from effects. And then finally, we've got a study right now that we're collaborating with some other folks at a number of universities on where we're trying to look at microbiome effects. And so really we're trying to tease out all these different uh, aspects of, of biological systems to, that could suffer some negative consequences of radiation exposure. And again, digging into some of the, the medical literature from, uh, from chemotherapy and things like that and trying to see you know, where do these chronic exposures fall within that spectrum in terms of effects. And, and to this point, we're, we're just not seeing the effects that that we see with some really acute high dose exposures. And so just to, to wrap up and leave you with a few concluding thoughts. And, and so this work is ongoing. You know, the, these studies take, take a real long time to, to develop and, and carry out, you know, given all the challenges working there. But to this point, you know, across both Chernobyl and Fukushima, we haven't seen you know, any evidence whatsoever that, that populations are suppressed. In fact, we're seeing, you know, Comp, you know, the composition of communities that are, you know, as diverse as other places, if not more diverse, uh, populations that are as abundant or more abundant. We're seeing natural recolonization and, and or, or natural, you know, productivity, uh, reproduction within these zones. 
And so ultimately, you know, from a, you know, a, a 30,000 foot view, if there are impacts, you know, they must be happening at, at an individual or molecular scale. But as I just, as I just illustrated, you know, we're just not seeing those molecular scale effects yet, which, which isn't to suggest that there aren't effects. It's just we're not seeing them in any of these metrics that we're evaluating so far and not at the dosages that we're seeing so far. And just to, to, to emphasize a point I made earlier on, a, a lot of the dose rates that are that occur in these areas are really high, but they're just not at the level that we might expect uh, chronic radiation exposure uh, effects. And so ultimately, I, you know, one of the take home messages for me on all this is, you know, reflecting on the effects that humans have on the landscape. I mean, you know, all of you that are, are wildlife biologists, you know, we all know that, that humans have impacts on the landscape and we, we cut down forests to, to plant crops and, and, uh, and build houses and things like that. And we know that that has, has impacts, but you know, a lot of times uh, we lose sight of that. And, and this suggests that you know, even in some of the most contaminated areas uh, that we have, animals can, can still survive when we remove that human factor. And just to, to leave you on a, another little high point, this is something that I, I've been really fascinated with. So, you know, in Chernobyl, as I mentioned early on, there's been some uh, introductions of wildlife into the exclusion zone, but there's also been some natural colonization as well. We've got Eurasian lynx, uh, one of the more common species that, that we're detecting on cameras there. Uh, brown bear, you know, the, there is a a brown bear that made a splash in the media several years ago that was sighted in, in Ukraine. We have some evidence that they're, they're also now in, in the Belarus portion of the exclusion zone, and, and there seems to be several individuals. So, so these aren't just dispersing individuals. It seems like they're, they're there and, and setting up shop. On the lower left there, that's a species we're, we're still trying to confirm, but we believe it's a, a European wildcat. And, and if so, that would be the first documentation of this species in, in Belarus in nearly a century. They, they occur in, in Ukraine, so, so not too far away. It's not, not too implausible. But, but again, uh, a potential natural colonization in the process. And, and many, many birds have been documented that have naturally colonized this area as well. And we're starting to see some similar things in, in Fukushima, and we'll see how it plays out. There are black bear and, and Japanese uh, sitka deer that we've documented in the exclusion zone. Now they do occur in those areas, they do disperse in those areas, but are, but are really uncommon. So, so one of the things I'm really excited about is to, to follow up these studies in Fukushima uh, throughout my career to see you know, how these populations respond over decades of, of human, human absence. And so with that, there's a, you know, a lot of folks that, that contributed to this research, a lot of graduate students and, and faculty and other researchers. And I, I wanna thank all of them and thank all of you for your attention. And uh, if we have time, uh, I'll gladly take any questions that you might have. Thank you, James. Um, folks, if you guys want, uh, you could either send 